Howdy, folks. Well, I hope this isn't my last time up here, but in the event that it is, how about we talk about how to survive? So I, I have been watching Google, obviously, for, for basically my entire adult life, my whole career, um, which has been here at Moz. And I want to start by sharing a story with you. It is not the most noble of businesses in the world. It's not necessarily the one you can fall in love with. But we don't always get the champions we want. We get the champions we get. This is the story of Celebrity Net Worth. CelebrityNetWorth.com was uh, uh, founded by Dan. Shoot, can't remember Dan's last name right now. Uh, so Dan, Dan starts this company. He started it because he and a bunch of friends uh, were curious about how much money Floyd Mayweather is worth. I know, I know. It turns out, apparently, Floyd is a very uh, extravagant spender. And so many, many people also were curious about, about how much uh, Floyd makes and how, how much he was worth. So. They start this business, it's actually going great. They're getting a ton of traffic from Google because so many people are curious about what celebrities are worth. And let, let's be fair, these folks, Dan and his team, dig in. Like they really, they care about this subject, they find it fascinating, and so they look up bank records and real estate transaction records, any public data they can get. They interview people, they try and get information about how much people are worth. They, they apparently, uh, had a fight with Larry David about how much he was actually worth, and they were right, and Larry David and his accountants were wrong. Um, and they get this nice note from Google. Nice, nice letter from Google. It's kind of exciting, right, to have Google say, we get a good amount of search queries about net worth of celebrities and important people. I am tasked with finding an authoritative site, and currently I'm exploring sources for net worth of celebrities' data sets. The ultimate goal is to enhance user experience at Google search. Well, that is flattering. That is very kind. But you know, Dan was kind of like, ah, uh, I, I don't see what value we get from this. Like, I get that Google's user experience would be better if we shared our whole data set with you, but, but I, 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 don't, I don't think it's worth it. So he replied and was like, thanks for thinking of us, but no thanks, not interested. But they went ahead and took the data anyway. They crawled it, they stored it, they built their own system to store Celebrity Net Worth's database. You know how he knows? You know how he knows? He knows because he put some of the names of his friends and fake people who are not celebrities into his data set and then Googled them and sure enough, he got the same answer box. The same answer box that came up, and he's like, oh, I know what you MFers did. I know what you did. And what do you think happened to their traffic? Down something like 65%. When they complained about it, Google did this. Google was like, oh, um, well, you know, we don't show celebrity net worth. We show other people who just happen to quote you, which that is just, just cold. And I think this model happens again and again. We see Google Trojan horsing, right? The, what's the Trojan horse? The Trojan horse is, oh, look, business, we have this, this beautiful, beautiful opportunity for rankings and visibility for you. Would, would you like to explore it? Oh my God, rankings and visibility. Come right into my walled city, please, by all means. And then op out. Uh, 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 out hop a bunch of soldiers and they steal all your traffic. And that's kind of sucks. So here's Google Trojan horsing uh, local events, right? They, they get the data from Eventbrite, right? They get the data from Meetup and then they just, they just take it and they put it in their own thing. Right, for right now, Eventbrite and Meetup are still getting some value from that because Google sends the traffic over to them, but I, I don't know if that's going to last. Job listings, same story. They have partners they work with now. If I were those partners, I'd be real worried about that disintermediation. Whether they had partners, then they were like, nope, don't need you anymore, thanks. Sports, same thing. They like had this big agreement with Major League Baseball, and then they kept cutting down and cutting down 
the value of the traffic that was sent and the amount of traffic that was sent and the, the recognition that they gave them. It's, it's kind of heartless and it's scary. But here we are all optimizing for Google, all giving them our data. And man, the fundamental contract, the fundamental contract that I remember us all having with the search engines from the 90s into the early 2000s and the mid 2000s, it was always, yes, we'll let you crawl us. You just make sure to give us credit when we give you the data. And that, that credit has been rolling back and rolling back and rolling back. And they are, they are changing the deal now that they're on top. So this model looks pretty consistent. Uh, Google basically like, oh, you, you know, to, if you want to do a great job answering this uh, searcher's query, we will, we will rank you up high. Um, uh, unless we have our own results, and then even if they are massively worse, uh, then we get to be first. Just, just how it is. You, Dr. Pete, right? Like, Pete, you were, you're talking about the mortgage calculator yesterday, right? The mortgage calculator. I don't have it in my deck, but it, if you go and use Google's mortgage calculator, there are numerous data points it does not include. If you go use Redfin's or even Zillow's, as long as you enter the right zip code, as long as you enter uh, the, the district that you're looking at, they'll put in the property value and the taxes and all the right stuff so you actually know what you're paying. Google's mortgage calculator sucks, but it ranks first because they get to put whatever they want first. I, I don't think that's just a bad deal for you know, Bankrate.com and Redfin and Zillow, I think that's a bad deal for everyone who looks for mortgage calculator and then finds out their house payment is actually gonna be way bigger than what Google told them. Not effing cool. Google says, you know, structure data like this and we'll make your listings more visible. Great, except you structure your data like this and it makes it easier for Google to take it and put it into their own database. They say, oh, these results are best for our users. These results are not best for Google's users. This is a phenomenal video. Well, the YouTube one is not, but the NBC Olympics one is. NBC Olympics has marked up their stuff properly. In fact, if you go to Google videos, you know, if you click on the videos tab in universal search results, you will find this video ranking. It's ranking like number 37 behind a ton of other YouTube clips but it is actually the video you want to watch. It's the high def version that was originally taped at the Olympics. It is full length. Everything on YouTube is just a clone or a copy. Most of them illegal of it, but Google ranks them first. I mean, come on, they're not even following their own DMCA guidelines. It is just, ugh. Don't get me wrong, Google does a lot of good stuff too, but when it comes to this sort of thing, I think you are right to be skeptical. I think you are right to be afraid. I think you're right to be freaking mad. Like real pissed off mad. There is a fundamental issue of fairness here. We do Google a good turn. We make them one of the most powerful businesses in the world. And make no mistake, there's a lot of smart engineers and a lot of venture capital money that made Google the great business that it is today. But there's also a lot of us. We made Google just as much as they made us. We made Google. And all they owe us is what they promised at the outset, traffic and credit. When they take that away, I am not okay with it. You shouldn't be either. So a lot of times we face this prisoner's dilemma, right? You, you give Google your content and then you risk Google using your data to build a feature that kills all your traffic, or you hold back, right? In the, in the case of stock twits here, uh, this is scuttlebutt that probably many of you have heard or seen you know, on Twitter over the years. This is a few years ago that Google sort of reached out to stock twits and was like, hey, how about we do a little deal, a little partnership, we'll show you the results and all this kind of stuff because we think you have real cool information here, but you, you're gonna have to break up some of your relationship with Twitter and stock twits was like, no. Uh, we, we don't want any part of it, and so Google worked with their competitors. At the time, it was Yahoo Finance, now Google has their own Google Finance, right? And so you, you get disintermediated, or, or you get blocked out by a competitor. I, I don't know how much value you know, Yahoo Finance gets from, or MSN Money from that tiny little link down there, but you know, it's something instead of nothing. And look, fear is not the only thing that's driving publishers in this case. Right? I mean, when, when Google starts talking about getting into your space or giving, giving answers, giving instant answers, giving instant data, I think there's other concerns, real concerns, fair ones. 
Some queries deserve more than a simple answer. They really do, even if that's what searchers want. Even if Google says, but searchers want a quick answer. They just want to solve their problem fast. Well, I, I, don't, I don't think that this is the best answer. I, when little boys and girls reach a certain age, they start accusing each other of having cooties. They regard each other as yucky and dirty because they have cooties and avoid any contact with them for fear of contracting cooties themselves. I, what? <laughs> Who? First off, you know your kids are at home right now using Google Home to find out about cooties, and this is what Google Home is telling them. I, come on. Climate change searches. Uh, this, uh, there, there was a great piece in Quartz uh, recently that I, that I shared a few weeks ago, sharing why you know, it's really hard uh, when the United States, which is still the, the world's most powerful economy and, and one of the world's most powerful uh, uh, political countries politically, uh, has the only population in the world that, that sort of fundamentally doesn't believe that climate change is real or how it's happening or what the facts are behind it. I, I think it's totally fine if you want to have a political discussion once you figure out what the facts are, right? Here's the facts. Okay, what do we want to do about this problem, right? But it's pretty ridiculous when, because you have Frankly, Google and Facebook, responsible for a lot of this, right? This, you, get, you get into these messes of people not understanding what's fundamentally going on in their, in their world. Politically charged content is another one, right? I, uh, I'm sad to say over the last year, I, I've been called the K word more times than I ever have in my whole life. That's been weird and new. Um, invited to lots of gas chambers. I, that's crazy, that's insanity. And then of course, you know, you see stuff like this, you're sort of like, oh, geez, Google, you have, a, you have a real problem around this type of content. This is, this is a problem. Or just dangerously incomplete answers, right? So my little brother, uh, Evan, some of you have, so, have met him. He's 11 years younger than me. So when I was in my early 20s or something, he was in Boy Scouts. Uh, and he goes out with his friends, and they, they go, and they, they played with a dead bat. Like they found a bat and it was dying and they thought, well, we'll care for it. And then, then it died and so they buried it in one of the kids' backyards. And then one of the moms was talking to one of her sons about the, day, the, events, day, the, day, the, the events of the day and she says, well, um, sorry, so you, you, you touched the bat with your hands and then you buried it and who was with you? And then she calls all the other moms and is like, okay, you need to take your kids in for rabies. Because it turns out, I don't know if you know this, once doctors can detect whether you have rabies or not, uh, you are already dead. Like, there's no way for them to save you. So I don't know if my brother actually got rabies, but they had to give him all these, like, painful giant spike injections in his lower spine to, you know, make sure that he didn't die from potentially getting rabies from playing with a dead bat. But Google, no! This is one of those where, like, just take away the instant answer. Take away this featured snippet. Make someone read the whole thing. Because if you read this, you could easily come away and be like, oh, OK, it's fine. We'll see if uh, they show any symptoms. Great, no problem. And then, then you have dead Boy Scouts, and nobody wants that. That's, that's bad news. So what is it? What, what do we do? What's our solution here? Stronger hands is part of it. Well. I'm going to show you sort of a, a plan, like a, a brief sort of five-point plan, and then I'll walk through a bunch of tactics. These are not just things that I would urge you to do to protect against, you know, Google Trojan horsing your industry or your field. These are, these are actually really good things for web marketing uh, and SEO as well, and that's, that's a great side benefit. Um, but let's, let's dive in. Okay. First off, I think we need to start developing uh, another new metric around our keyword strategy, right? One that's segmenting searcher intent, um, in particular by how complex a query is. I'll, I'll walk you through that. In terms of content strategy, I think we need to prioritize more complex tasks and taking people all the way through those tasks so that Google can't disintermediate us simply by answering one particular uh, problem, right, or, or providing one particular solution. We've also got to diversify our traffic sources. This is something we've been focused on for a long time. It is getting much more difficult, thanks to the stats that I showed you at the beginning uh, of, of, of the conference on Monday, right? I mean, Google is just incredibly dominant, insanely dominant in terms of how much traffic they refer. 
And we need to tie some of our, our business goals up to our SEO content. Uh, when, when those things get away from each other is when I think we start to expose ourselves to A, more risk, and we, we don't have the resources that we need to invest. And then finally, we've got to be thinking about Google's future plans in our own. So these five will take us there. All right, let me show you some examples. I think it, it's way easier to, to get a grasp of what I'm trying to talk about uh, by looking at examples. So first one I'm going to start with is index.co. Index.co is a, a B2B data resource site. They essentially provide information about uh, mostly high growth technology companies, although lots of other kinds of companies that uh, angel investors and venture investors would put money into. And they do, in my opinion, a vastly better job of it than, than most other folks in the market, uh, especially for being mostly free. So when I was doing research you know, for, for Moz's board of directors, we're considering you know, this acquisition or that acquisition, uh, index.co was invaluable to me to say, hey, is it true that you know, once the ball starts rolling in acquisition in a field, does that tend to be the case that the players who don't participate uh, get left behind? And it you know, turns out, no, that, that's not generally the case. But you can see them segmenting searcher intent, right? essentially uh, uh, breaking out parts of what people are looking for. So this one, this one right here, see it says acquisitions. So you can click on any of these tabs and get acquisitions. And in fact, index.co ranks really well for uh, you know, any space in technology plus acquisitions. So you, you search for like healthcare tech acquisitions or email marketing acquisitions or uh, social networking, uh, social network monitoring acquisitions. They, they rank really well. They prioritize complex tasks, like trying to figure out uh, what are all the acquisitions in a space, who's been making them, who's the biggest acquirer in the space, what's the recency of those, what's the total dollar value. You can start to save these things to lists. Uh, they've been diversifying their traffic pretty darn well, actually, getting a lot of it from referrals. Granted, some of that is from their relationship with the next web. And then syncing up business goals you know, with their SEO and content, so essentially offering a, the, the, the SEO that they do is all based on this idea that people will need to do deeper research, and that is why they will subscribe to a deeper data set from index.co. So really smart. The whole platform is built around attracting the right kinds of customers for their business. And, I think they are wise to incorporate Google's plans in their future, right? And here you, you can see this is what Crunchbase always should have been. I think that is, that is a key point. If you can say we are what next best competitor always should have been, that's a pretty good uh, assessment of what Google's future might be. Because I think when they go into these spaces, when they do their Trojan horsing, they're essentially saying, oh, you know, we, this information is somewhat interesting, but we don't like the ad model, or we don't like the user experience, or we don't think it's providing great info for searchers, or we're going to replace this, right? This is Eater. I think uh, Eater has built something really interesting in a space that many people thought was way, way, way too uh, difficult to get into. By the way, some of you might have seen me tweet excitedly uh, earlier this year that Kenji Lopez-Alt uh, from, from Serious Seats and who's contributed to Eater um, and who wrote the Food Lab Cookbook would be here at MozCon this year. But then he had kids, and so, um, so we, I think he became a father something like 35 days ago and was like, I'm sorry, I just can't make it to MozCon. But hopefully, hopefully Moz um, will be able to get him in the future. And Eater does a great job of this, right? Segmenting their, their searcher intent by all of the different types of content they put out there, prioritizing complex tasks, like assembling this, OK, what, not just what restaurant do I want to go to, but when I'm visiting a city, what are all the places I want to see? And if I'm a restaurateur, what opportunities do I have? And if I'm interested in food culture, how do I understand that whole space? Uh, they also have done a nice job of diversifying traffic, at least Sort of historically, I think recently they've been getting so good at SEO that it's been running away. Uh, this is all via similar web pro, by the way. Uh, it's been running away with their, with their channels. And then they, they sync up their business goals with their SEO and content. So they do these really cool things. Um, you can watch this. So this is essentially content that they created exclusively so that they could have uh, their own owned video content because they knew that they could, they're an ad-based business, right? So they knew they could do more advertising work by involving this in here. And you can watch a, a video of this incredible Japanese chef uh, making high quality tempura at, at a Michelin starred restaurant. And then they, they did what I, I think is really smart, which is they went, okay, how would Google attack this? 
Oh, you know what they would do? They would turn the lists that they create, you know, the card style lists, they'd turn those into overlaid maps with information about each restaurant and how to book and reserve so that you can easily go and, and choose which restaurant you want to go to. Bam, right? They just, what I love is they're like, oh, Google's going to disintermediate us. We're going to disintermediate future Google. You don't, we don't need that. Smart. Uh, the Muse, so the Muse does, uh, helps companies with recruiting. Uh, they're, in, they're in the B2B space, obviously. And again, same story, segmenting searcher intent by different types of jobs, functions, geography, all the things that you would need, uh, making those accessible, unlike some of their competitors. Uh, doing a nice job of prioritizing complex tasks, like they actually, for all the people who are featured on the Muse, and Moz participated in this as well, they send someone to your office to take photographs, to video and interview some of your staff members and get a sense for the culture there, uh, to do like a full sort of journalistic style write-up on your company. And they're not gonna make you look bad, right, because you're paying them, but it is a way better, more in-depth look at the type of company you're gonna be getting than what you can get with 99% of, you know, oh, it's a job ad on Monster. Well, there'll be some text and then a bunch of legalese and then a button to click to apply, right? Uh, they've also done, well, had done, like Eater, a really solid job of diversifying their traffic, but they've gotten much better at SEO <laughs> lately and so have been growing that dramatically. Uh, they also do a nice job of syncing those business goals with SEO and content uh, and incorporating Google's future into their plan, in, in particular with that creation of profiles for the employers. I think that is something Google will not be able to take away, and that is, that's powerful. Uh, one more, Redfin, I think they've done an excellent job. I mentioned their mortgage calculator, but they do a lot of smart things here, even though Redfin is not nearly the SEO player in the real estate space that Zillow is. And look, uh, Redfin, Redfin is going public sort of as we speak. They, they already filed their S1. I think it's really exciting that Seattle's going to have another big public company uh, and in the real estate space. But what I'm, you know, what I'm excited about is to potentially maybe get someone from Redfin's SEO team uh, here next year. So um, Glenn Kelman, their CEO, and I have been friends for a while. And eh, once their quiet period's over, I'm hoping you know, maybe they'll come here and do what Steph Chang did uh, with Etsy. Uh, they do a great job segmenting that searcher intent, right? So they keep their content that's designed to help you separate from their, uh, their house listings. Uh, and, then, and then target those separately. They really do a fantastic job prioritizing complex tasks. I think of all the, of all the businesses I mentioned in here, just awesome. So not only will they have you know, the standard listing information, but they'll get a lot deeper by going to the multiple listing service. And this is why, generally speaking, in the real estate market field, when you talk to an agent or something, even they won't say, oh yeah, use our website. They'll say, use Redfin's website, because most of the best data is there. And then they do two really cool things, which is uh, they estimate the price based on small changes in a market uh, from nearby homes that they can monitor with their MLS data, which is, tends to be better than a Zestimate when they can give it to you. Zestimate is Zillow's. And then they also have a uh, list at the bottom of any house page. They have a list of what it takes to win a house in this neighborhood. So then they'll have their brokers who leave stories. Every broker who sells for them or buys for them leaves a story on every transaction, and then they pull in those transaction notes so that you can see what the sale process was like. So it'll say, you know, this we put in an offer at 110% over market, and we dropped all contingencies, and we lost to an all-cash offer that was 120% because it's Seattle and we're all screwed. Uh, just a fact. They've done a nice job diversifying their traffic as well. You can see they're actually growing some of their other channels in addition to search, which is pretty impressive. And they do a nice job of syncing up those business and SEO goals. Clearly, they're trying to attract a lot of people uh, in order to use them not only for buying, but also for selling. In fact, they, they tend to be a stronger, they tend to be stronger on the sell side because that's where all the, all the money is saved for the, for the seller. Uh, in terms of incorporating Google's future, I love that they are doing things that Google cannot and will not ever do, like real estate classes, like come with us and go tour this home. You can't get into a home, right, unless you have a real estate license and someone there. But right on their website, they're like, oh, are you in this neighborhood right now? This is the next time an agent from Redfin would be available. You can click the button and book a tour, you know, 45 minutes out. Just pr pretty darn remarkable. So got a pretty good idea of this, this five-point plan. I want to know which one I opened. Yeah, this one. All right. 
let's dive into some tactics. And I do have some, I have some, I have some cool ones in here. All right. First off, I was talking about how uh, we want to prioritize, like, like add a different dimension to our cured research. So you have, you have the normal metrics, right? And um, you know, Moz came out with its Keyword Explorer, and then I think Ahrefs was like, that's a great name. We'll come out with a Keyword Explorer too. And then w a few weeks ago, someone else came out with a Keyword Explorer. So there's lots of Keyword Explorers now. Um, note to Mozers, we should name our things things that are harder to copyright, uh, or things that are easier to copyright. Uh, and so they've got, they, you've got all these great metrics. But one thing that's not in here, you could put it in your important score, right, that you can, that you can set yourself. One thing that's not in here is like, are these queries easy to answer? Could Google do it with a voice search or a feature snippet or an instant answer? And if you can identify the ones that they could not do it with, you might prioritize those above ones even that have slightly better looking you know, volume data and those sorts of things because you go, this is gonna be safe for a long time. Right? Google has not tried to disintermediate or take away a lot of complex uh, search queries. They've really focused on that. So yeah, my, my example, right? Uh, for example, let, let, let's imagine, I know it's scary to imagine, but zombie apocalypse hits. There's gonna be a lot of searches for queries like this. Are zombies real? What's the origin of zombies? But far more difficult queries to answer are underwater zombies and can zombies swim? Um, already has surprising search volume in my opinion. I don't, I don't, I, I often wonder like who needs to know? Why are you asking? I just, I just wanna check on that, right? But those are, those are more complicated. Uh, in this case, right, there's a featured snippet, which is great. What I love is it does what Pete was talking about the other day where it says, you know, it ends with a cliffhanger. Like I cannot answer my query with just what's in there. I need to click deeper. Anytime you have in instant answer content, anytime you have featured snippet content, anytime you have a bullet point list, do what your meta description does, what your title is supposed to do. Be the snippet that draws the click, right? This is just like any other snippet. It needs to draw the click. Number three, I I'm gonna urge you to invest in content that Google, one of two things, that they either can't show in the search results or you know, in whatever product they're doing or that builds your brand when they do. So I think we all know Google owns Waymo. They're working on self-driving cars. They almost certainly in the future will try and either compete with or buy Uber or Lyft. Maybe a third one, I don't know. But in this case, I think it actually is smart for Uber and Lyft to play in this space, to say, yes, Google, we will partner with you, we will give you our data, because it builds their brand, it gets them more traffic, it gets them more customers when they do it, I would be nervous. I would be really nervous if it were the case that Google simply provided the information but didn't give them a direct path, right? If there's no direct path to like go to your Lyft app, assuming you have that installed, and book the vehicle, ooh, a little, a little tough to want to contribute that. Uh, interactive content works great for this. Anytime you have interactive content, this is, um, this is an amazing, amazing calculator. I think the website is, yeah, let's crunch it. Um, and essentially it's, if any of you are thinking about building a subscription business, either as part of what you're doing now or in the future or on your own, uh, this is great because you can sort of plug in a bunch of numbers and assumptions and you can see what the trajectory of the business's growth would look like and whether you'll be, the, be okay or be insolvent and that kind of stuff. This is very difficult for Google to disintermediate, right? They could come out with a crappy one like they did for Mortgage Calculator, but I think eventually the word of mouth gets around and it's like, hey, Google's Mortgage Calculator doesn't work. You should use something more advanced. Uh, interactive content, great way to do that. Number four, I'm gonna suggest that we need to make our internal search, site search, and our navigation paths better than what Google can provide. If it's the case, that the easiest way to navigate your website is to go to Google and type in thing I want, your website name, that's, that's bad for you. That's dangerous for you. I would, I would caution against that. I think that's why two things are the case. One, it's awesome that we can do keyword research that involves our own brand names, and we should. That is, that is truly a missing tactic um, that, that we need to start doing. And also that, uh, when we can provide navigation that it is intuitive and easy to use uh, and matches what people are seeking 
and is contextually relevant, right? It, it matches like, oh, you want to do this next thing right now because you were here and you had this problem. So you know what? I'm not going to serve you only the navigation we offer. I'm going to do like Will Reynolds was talking about day, uh, day two in the morning yesterday. You know, here's what I think you want after you read this piece. This, I think, scares the crap out of Eater. Right? This is essentially Google disintermediating the list. So this is, this is the Austin 38, you know, the, the restaurants that Eater says are the coolest and best ones that you should definitely visit while you're in Austin. And Google just scrapes it and then lists it in card format in order. That, that, that sucks, right? That's, I think that's really hard. Oops, that's really hard for them. But the positive thing is that Google's uh, UX on this is not nearly as good as what Eater's is. Eater's is by neighborhood. Eater includes the direct link to the reservation. Eater includes the link to the website and the phone number and the menu. They think about all the rest of the tasks that you need to accomplish and therefore offer that in their navigation. Great. Super smart. Uh, Memorandum. This this is basically a one-page website, right? Has been, has been for years. And the reason it remains relevant over you know, sources like Google Politics, right? Google News's politics section, is that it's so well organized and it's so consistent, right? It always takes the top stories from you know, hundreds of different sources, from you know, many different sides of the, of the political aisles, and then it aggregates them to get together there in the way that political junkies are most interested in. Right? And for me, this is, this is memorandum, sort of how I stay up to date on like, what's coming from all the different perspectives uh, in, the, in the political world. Uh, in Etsy's case, right, I think Steph touched on this a little bit, right, but there, Etsy is doing a great job of serving two things, right, conscious and unconscious needs in a UX that Google can't compete with. So Google might be able to say with its shopping results, hey, you want this one particular drill down, but not and if you want to explore, here's all the ways you might explore. Uh, and Go Etsy does a wonderful job of this on their left side and top navigation, giving you the pathways that you would want to go to from each one. Number five, uh, we, if we're going to get traffic from anywhere on the web, if we're going to participate in these channels that we don't own and control, we better drive all of it back to channels that we do own, that we do control. And really, there's only two, uh, maybe three, two and a half, let's say two and a half. The half is your mobile app. A mobile app is half owned by you and half owned by the app marketplace, right? By, by Google Play or by the, by the Apple Store. The two are your website, which is truly owned and controlled by you, and email which if you own those email addresses, you can always change your provider, but generally speaking, it is owned and controlled by you. So we need to drive all of our traffic to those places. And that's why I think it's totally fine to contribute and, and offer up our data in all sorts of places, wherever Google wants to put it, so long as we can drive it back. Right? What, what's dangerous is the celebrity net worth thing, where they take it and they give us no credit, or they take it and they give us minimal credit that you can't even click on. What's not dangerous is any time we can drive that back to ourselves. No matter what channel you're using to sort of you know, broadcast or distribute, I, I would strongly urge you to make, make that go back to your domain. And Instagram, you can do this, right? I, I do this uh, with my Skillshare classes. This is why I you know, fly to New York and I'll spend a whole day filming an hour-long class for Skillshare because they, they, they have a big platform and I know they will help to drive that traffic uh, back to Moz. Number six, if you want to outrank Google, even in these searches where they are getting real fancy, right, like the job listings one, and again, I'm stealing, I'm stealing from a tweet Pete sent about how, uh, how tough this SERP is to crack, guess what you can do? If you capture emails or you capture cookies, you can retarget or you can remarket. RLSA, right, remarketed list for search advertising means that I can appear above Google's listings to the people who I know are going to be most likely to click on me anyway. And by the way, those, uh, those PPCers tend to have the lowest cost per click, which is also awesome. Number seven, I'm going to call out Gianluca for this one. Uh, so if you are going to get into a space where you know Google is going to be showing uh, is going to be competing directly, or if you're already in that space, one of the few options you have is to try and bias searchers in your favor. 
And how do we bias searchers in our favor? Well, if we could get them to put in our brand name to the search query, that means we win over whatever else Google might show. And in this case, Trivago did just that, right? They basically ran advertising campaigns that specifically told you, hey, when you think about Googling hotels, right, when you think about searching for hotels, search for Hotel Trivago, Hotel Trivago. And of course, you saw the spike in search demand. You then saw it enter related searches. You then saw it enter uh, search suggest. If you're going to invest in, in, in branded uh, advertising, see if you can get those branded ads to also help your SEO. It's a very powerful thing when those two channels can work together. Number eight, one of the ways that we can end around Google is by having the people who are influential to our audiences. When I say influential, I don't just mean, you know, whatever it is, um, the hot Instagrammer of the moment or the followed celebrity on YouTube. I mean influencers of all kinds, right? That could be uh, journalists, it could be blogs, it could be publications of any type, it might be brands that are followed, it might be conferences and events, long, long list. If you can get in front of those people and have them amplify you to your market, wow, fantastic. You can, you can get ahead of Google. So in this case, uh, this is a company here in Seattle, local startup called CrowdCow. Uh, the, fa <laughs> so the, the founder, Ethan, uh, his, his wife told him, look, Ethan, I'm vegetarian, and I'm not particularly cool with you eating meat, but I know you're not going to give it up. So at least if you're going to eat meat, can you find the most ethical way to do that? And he was like, well, yeah, OK, that's fair. So he went and talked to some small ranchers uh, in Santa Barbara, where he, where he moved to from Seattle, and found these like ethically sourced, you know, humanely raised, relatively speaking, right? It's you still got to kill them to eat them. But, uh, and, and, built, and then built a business off of it, because he found that all of his friends wanted to jump in and, and buy cows with him, uh, or parts of cows. And, what CrowdCow did in order to get in front of folks, because they basically said, hey, you know what? There's, there's literally 100 times more search volume for like Omaha steaks than there is for um, order steaks online, right? And so they were like, ah, oh, geez, great. So we rank for order steaks online, and we get, what, one-tenth of that? No. How, how are we going to get in front of all the people who order from them who are already doing this, who are already biased these other brands? And so they went out to the influencer world, and they were like, OK, who? Do we need to influence? Well, we got to reach mainstream foodies, so uh, we can do that through you know, food and wine. And we can reach the sous vide aficionados. Sous vide folks are like obsessed with getting the best possible quality steak because you can really taste it once you, when you do the steak in the sous vide. So they went to sous vide guy.com. Uh, and then they, they went to the paleo foodies, because paleo folks tend to be very obsessed with, with proteins of all kinds. And then they went to, um, generally speaking, what I'd call just like fancy pants folks. I don't know, I don't know what the word for that is. You know, like rich people who spend their money on whatever's hot right now. So East End Taste, perfect, perfect influencer for that. And locavores, right? People who are really interested in ordering stuff just that's right near them that comes from local farms. Bam, right? Go to every one of those. They reached out. They formed those relationships. Made it happen. And you can see the results. Like now, now CrowdCow is about to top buy beef online. That's awesome. That's the power of going through the influencer route rather than just attacking the SERP and the SEO and the, the search demand itself. Pretty cool opportunity there. Uh, number nine. So Google pretty much always solves queries at the uh, solution level, right? You, you tell Google you have a problem, they try and provide you with solutions. But before, well, all right, what, the way to play this in my opinion, is to basically say you want that high percentage of visitors, uh, uh, of people in the field, right, saying this. So plug in your own, your own brand name. Why would I ever Google your key search term when you solve this problem so completely and so elegantly? Why would I go to Google first? Right? Dribble is solving that same issue, but they're solving it at the problem level. Like before you realize you, you have it there, they're, they're ahead of that curve. They're ahead of the here's the list of solutions. Before your audience needs a solution, they have a problem, right? If you beat Google to the punch, you can be there for that problem's discovery. 
I'll show you what I mean. On the left, we have Google trying to provide a solution for kitchen remodeling ideas. On the right, we have House, who's basically like, you're thinking about your home. Let me offer you all the things you might think about in relation to home. You could think about a new stove. You might think about a kitchen redesign. You might think about redoing your bathrooms. You might think about colors. You might think about the backsplash. You might think about a million different things, right? And, and they are capturing that. Uh, here, uh, solution level, right? So um, Google is offering solutions to the problem of, I need a payment system. NerdWallet is capturing all the people who might eventually need a POS system or some sort of payment solution before they need it, and then they're offering content around it. You trust them, right? You go to them first. Last one. If Google's already in your space, if you're sort of like, okay, Rand, this, this would have been a great presentation to hear about four years ago. I'm with you. I gotcha. I know. I think the only way to play this, if Google's already in your space, is to say, you know what? Google doesn't offer everything. They don't offer enough. And most of the time, they don't. Most of the time, Google provides a very simple solution. Now, maybe for 80% of folks who Google the weather, this is good enough. But for the 20% for whom it isn't, there's Wonderground. And Wonderground does an awesome job across all of those two and a half channels, including a mobile app that I think is, is really quite great. It's my favorite weather app so far. And, and what they try and do here is they say, you know what, there's a million pieces of data that Google doesn't provide around the forecast. They don't provide it with enough clarity. They don't give you enough detail. They don't give you the best locations. They're not giving you the best forecasting. They don't give you the rain data. They don't give you the uh, uh, allergy data in there. They don't give you the history and the calendar and what's the expected temperature. We will. We will solve every problem that Google doesn't solve around this, and we'll build loyalty through it. And they kind of nail it. Like, they nail it, this is so, so much better than Googling weather 98105, right? So look, Google is coming for you. They're coming for all of us. I, I think it's, you know, pretty bad business to put our heads in the sand and hope that they never hit our field or our industry or something that is an opportunity for us. But we don't have to just fight off this dragon. We can jump on its back and make, us, make it fly us around the skies like it was always supposed to. Thank you very much.